stories about water and urban places, this is ID Anthro. Hey everyone, and welcome back to ID Anthro, and welcome back to Front of Mind Season 1. This series where we nab ourselves a guest from our broader water or stormwater industry and sit down with them to have a chat about what's interesting them, fascinating them, maybe even puzzling them at the moment. Our guest today comes to us from the Netherlands. Our guest is Floris Bolhard. Once again, I hope I'm doing an okay job of that. Floris, welcome okay. along. Thank you. Nice so, to be here. So if you haven't seen Floris' previous episode on ID Anthro, Floris is a professor from the Netherlands has done a lot of research into past in sustainable urban drainage systems, which is, I suppose, a European, particularly a UK name for, but a European name for kind of the equivalent to water-sensitive urban design. And recently, Floris has been doing some research into swales, which, am I right in thinking they're called whiteys in the Netherlands? Is that yeah, the right term? Bodies. Whiteys, yep. yeah. Swales, and particularly how quickly the water drains away from them, which is really relevant to an idea answer because... In episode 213, we were talking about emerging research about how bioretention systems disappear far more water than we previously thought. And on a very recent episode of ID Anthro, in fact, unreleased at the time that Floris and I are speaking right now, Alan Hoban and I had a chat about the implications of this research and some other recent research. So this is very topical. So without further ado, Floris, do you want to give us, like, where do we, where do we get into this? Where do we get into this research? What is it? Why does it interest you? Yeah, uh, well, my work is basically mostly in the Netherlands, uh, and in the Netherlands there are a lot of doubts on infiltrating with swales or permal pavement. Mm -hmm. And of course, that well, probably everybody is aware that we live below sea level, most of the country, uh, up to almost 10 meters below, so most of the, the western part of the Netherlands is uh, having very high groundwater tables, up to 50 centimeters under the, under the ground. And uh, there's a lot of clay soil, so a very low permeability. So there's a lot of doubts by municipalities and, and water authorities to implement sustainable urban drainage systems. Um, and I think, well, what I saw from monitoring that it's actually uh, the, the swales or the permal pavement are functioning quite well. And, um, and because of this worst case scenario, what we have on the groundwater table, perma, uh, low permeable soil, I did some research, uh, mostly on permal pavement, and uh, uh, the latest is really on swales. So I flooded in the, the low lying parts of the Netherlands uh, about 30 swales, full scale, so uh, totally submerged. Uh, the maximum height is mostly 30 centimeters, and I found that uh, actually all the swales that we researched were empty within two days, which is quite fast if you uh, consider the, the special circumstances that we have. So that's quite positive. Yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. And so the question that like that I am dying to know, and this applies to both the bioretention research that's you know that Alan has dug up and then for this research as well is where do you feel the water's going I'll, I'll let you answer that then I'll explain the context as to why I because that, that might you might be sitting there going well that's fairly obvious Jack it's such and such but give me your answer then I'll explain why I why that's fascinating me yeah I've, uh, well where the water is going uh, most of the Netherlands it, it, it really depends the swales are uh, different uh, some are filled with a bit of uh, uh, sandy soil on the top, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, sometimes it goes a bit uh, faster. But I'm really interested in basically uh, low-lying grassy fields that uh, don't have a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, underneath it. So no, mm -hmm. sometimes even no drainage pipes or anything like that. Because I find that the most sustainable, that's the most nature-based, uh, etc. So, and that's basically what me uh, surprised me that the water would go so fast in the ground. And at those uh, fields, mostly, what I found is that uh, the vegetation, if it's really growing uh, quite fast, and you only have 30 centimeters, that there's actually a lot of uh, storage room in the ground itself, mm -hmm. especially if it's if it's dry, so the water could infiltrate, especially if it's only 30 centimeter, which, which is not a lot, then there, there's quite some space for the water to infiltrate to uh, deeper layers. So... Um, okay, okay, so yeah, so you're thinking, 
you know, field capacity, soil infiltration. So the reason that I want to ask this is there's like, we've got these papers emerging about bioretention systems, which obviously are a little bit different because a lot of the ones in these papers are lined. They have a very sandy soil that's up to, you know, 500 mils or even more deep with some gravel beneath. So there's clearly a lot of storage capacity in them. And we're seeing the volumetric losses vary a fair bit between them, but uh, they, you know, the papers have been identified, averaging out around 60% of the water going into them never comes back out the under drainage pipes. Now there is a fair bit of variation between systems there. But what's really fascinating is a lot of the systems that have had that monitoring done, that hydrologic monitoring done, have actually their primary purpose of the monitoring has been for pollutant removal. So we've also got pollution removal values. And in my opinion, if you stick together what we know about how pollutant removal, and if anyone wants a more detailed explanation of this, go to episode 213. But if you stick together what we know about pollutant removal in the lab and the way lab scale systems with no volumetric losses or very, 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 very little volumetric losses filter out pollutant, and you stick it together with the results from the field that show similar load reductions in pollutant, but also the volumetric reduction. It seems to me like the logical conclusion for bioretention systems is that they are evapotranspiring a large proportion of this water that disappears, like far more than a standard crop factor, you know, a bit of calculation would suggest they should be. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on that and whether you've considered that in the context of your swales or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, of course we have to consider the different uh, uh, climates th- that we have in the Netherlands. Of course. Uh, it, you know, we, we rarely have high temperatures or long dry periods as, as you would have. But uh, especially in the summer, you can uh, quite lose uh, uh, quite some millimeters of, of water on the uh, EVA transpiration. So that, that's really something that's a, a large difference uh, between the lab results and, uh, and the field. If you go up to uh, more than 10 millimeters, of course, uh, in a day already. So, uh, but still, yeah, for, for, the, for the research in the Netherlands, I mean, that, that would be uh, a couple of centimeters off the 30 centimeters. So mm-hmm. still most of the, the, the water should go into the soil and would be infiltrating. But uh, that's a, a very interesting thought. Yeah, does the, um, how does the amount that you're losing compared to, like, when you saw how quickly it drained away, or maybe actually rephrase that, when you were about to do the research and you were looking at the sorts of soils that you had, did you expect it to drain away that quickly or did it surprise you? Yeah, it was surprising for me because I'm, I'm quite positive on um, in, uh, infiltrating in the, in the low-lying parts because, well, I'm, I'm working on this uh, more than 20 years now. But uh, especially because a lot of people are quite negative on uh, the, the possibilities of, of, in this worst case scenarios, uh, infiltrating. Uh, I, w- I was quite, even for me, <laughs> really surprised that uh, in some circumstances uh, that you really have groundwater up to 20 or 30 centimeters under the soil that you're actually infiltrating in. Yeah. And uh, at clay soils in the, the southern part of the Netherlands, that, that's really clay, it's, it's, a, it's a delta. And still it would infiltrate within uh, two days. That, that's, that's quite surprising for me as well. Yeah, and, and mostly what, what I found is that uh, if, the, if the grass, uh, it, the grass or the, the vegetation is quite a big part of that. Okay. If you have a good vegetation, there's a lot of uh, bio, uh, you know, bio life in the, in the topsoil that can infiltrate a lot. But I found also that in some locations, uh, because uh, this, the, the testing is mostly done in dry circumstances and yep. mostly in uh, pleasant circumstances, so mostly the summer, uh, when you get a ton, tank truck out and uh, I mostly do it with young professionals as well, these testing, so mostly uh, are done in the summer. And of course, then you have a really dry and uh, uh, beginning situation that, that, that's quite positive on the infiltration. Yep. So the latest uh, re- uh, research that I've done is actually repeating uh, the full scale test. Yep. So after it's not even uh, totally empty, I will do it again and do it again. And then I found that um, the infiltration capacity could be, if, if, if it's saturated, it, it takes quite a longer time. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so the first time, for example, 
uh, you would have an empty time of two hours, it would go really quickly. Yeah. But the second time, it would more than double. And if you do it the third time, it could be really, uh, uh, really up to one day or something. So uh, it, it really goes up. So this the is empty time of, of a swill, and that, that that's quite interesting for for the Netherlands because we don't uh, model that in uh, in models basically. Yeah. Mostly we have only one uh, uh, probability in, in your models, and this could lead to uh, uh, an overestimation of the water that would infiltrate. Yeah. Lead to uh, maybe flooding, uh, if you, if, uh, even if you don't calculate that with the model. Yeah, exactly. And this is the this is this is exactly what I'm considering in Australia because I like I'm really interested in the bioretention research. I know we're like making a like a non like for like comparison here, but it's the the context with which this is making sense to me. But uh, I'm really interested in it because you know with 60% volumetric losses showing up, that's possibly profound enough to mean we could install smaller pipes in you know for the minor drainage system for the small storm events in new urban areas or potentially install rain gardens in lieu of pipe upgrades very much like um, some of the the systems that i saw in july when i was over and when you know when you pointed me towards some stuff and when lot took me to some stuff in amsterdam as well and that really interests me because of course you know maybe i'm wanting to build a rain garden for pollutant removal or environmental purposes but if it can offset some flood, you know, some stormwater drainage costs, then that's great for, for me, right? Because it offsets the, the cost of building what can be quite an expensive system. Yeah. Um, but of course, the big question or the big assumption that's made in flood, like flood management or stormwater management in Australia is our pipes will restore their capacity very soon after a storm event. You essentially have to have a storm event that has to drain out and you have to have capacity very, very soon again because we can get yeah. you know, these really heavy intense, like it's rained in the past day or so. Yeah, context for people listening to this, right? I essentially can't have a chat with Floris without it raining on us, right? You remember last time we filmed? So, uh... Floris, how long was it since we stopped filming that that started raining? A couple of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're very lucky. Yeah, as we're recording this right now, we've just had like a couple of hundred mils in Brisbane in several days, and it's just we had to delay this chat for an hour because it stormed and I couldn't possibly record any audio in it. Um, but of course, we need to have our anything that we're implementing for a drainage purpose. We need to have it be able to deal with these big rainfall events and then the fact that we might get a massive storm the next day because our rainfall pattern is not small and consistent it's large intense and inconsistent so so this okay so this research so you're starting to dabble into the i suppose antecedent like loading systems time and time again what's and you're seeing the infiltration rate slow down you quoted a couple of different times to me. You said like the first time you load a system, it might take a couple of hours to go away, but then it slows yeah. down. And then early in the chat, I think, and if you, if you didn't tell me otherwise, but I think you mentioned two days. So is it a case like when a system's got really good dry conditions initially, a couple of days to drain down? Uh, sorry, a couple of hours to drain down. And then what, after a few loadings, a couple of days? Is that the sort of space you're in? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it really goes up. So uh, meaning that all the testing that I'm doing, mostly I, I start with the initial uh, phase that it, it has been dry for two days. It didn't rain. Uh, but I found out that you know um, that it might be that uh, if you want to do more accurate uh, uh, testing, that you have to maybe wait longer, or uh, because the initial. Uh, conditions of your of your swill or permal pavement really uh, is, is is a very uh, yeah important factor when when you're doing the testing and um, uh, so so and, and, and quite surprised me of course it, it, it doesn't surprise if you if you would uh, flood it again it would get slower but uh, but really if it's if it's saturated and it might be uh, something that that's uh, uh, a bit on the on the Dutch side because we have the groundwater table 
and if it's only 50 centimeters under the ground and you will fill 30 centimeters and 30 centimeters again of course you, you flooded the whole uh, the whole swill that would be different in New Zealand or Australia um, for sure for that case although it's so, a little I think I think if someone wants to picture this on a small scale if anyone's ever done hydraulic conductivity testing of say a bioretention system with where you stick a PVC ring in the ground and fill it and let it drain down and keep refilling it you'll know that yeah. the first time you fill it it drains away really quickly because it's all getting up yeah. bottom and heading sideways but then once you wet down the surrounding soil then it starts to slow down and eventually stabilizes to what you consider to be the real saturated hydraulic conductivity yeah 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 yeah, exactly, and, and maybe it's good to mention as well why, um, because I did the infiltrometer test, which right. is the double ring, yes. uh, and then you're measuring the, the middle ring, yep. but I found out that uh, actually uh, it's it's quite inaccurate or not representative for the whole swale, yep. because if you would move the rings like only one uh, meter or something, you could have a factor of 10 different or 100, so th that's why I basically fill whole swales yep. uh, because it's more accurate and it's it's uh, uh, yeah it's a, it's a bit yeah uh, and and that's why because I think with the ring uh, if you would fill it again fill it again on the same spot it might you know it still has a lot of uh, 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 a lot of room to, to flow away the water but if you fill a, to, uh, a complete uh, swale that, that's a bit more difficult of course because you, you wet the whole a yes. whole uh, uh, swill area in this case, and thinking thinking of this, of course, yeah, Netherlands is a bit different than Australia and New Zealand. I'm uh, actually because I'm, I'm quite fascinating how uh, suds work in different climates. We we can maybe even go more worst case, and it will be Norway right. or uh, Scandinavian countries where they don't have a lot of suds yet, but uh, there are quite some uh, rainwater gardens now implemented in Sweden and even Norway. Oh, right. There's one, uh, rain, yeah, there's one rainwater garden uh, for a project called InXS, so Innovation for Extreme Climate Events, okay. uh, where we compare uh, things in Norway to uh, in Romania and in the Netherlands. And actually even the same conclusions that, that you have and I have that in, in Norway, the, what, they were really quite surprised on the amount of water they could actually infiltrate in, in frozen soil. Yeah, right. So we might... <laughs> and, yeah, so... And surely, I mean, yeah, surely my, surely my evapotranspiration hypothesis doesn't hold in, you know, Norway in a frozen, cold climate. Surely not. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Huh. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I really want to do more research on on, uh, on this. And uh, yeah, schedule was so positive, but what are the factors? And uh, of course, because there's a, a large variation of uh, swales. Even uh, there was one uh, municipality, uh, one district that had a lot of swales. Uh, and they were constructed in the same way. Uh, you could say that the, the geo-hydrologic circumstances are, of course, in the district the same, but still they showed quite a difference in, in empty time of the swales, mm. which fascinates me as well, because that's a whole swale. That's not an, an infilter ring that you that you move on uh, one meter, but you would expect that they would have similar results, but still there was a difference in, in a couple of hours or maybe even a factor of two or three. Well, and that's, so that, that's fascinating as well. Yeah, and that's the same as like these papers that Alan has dug up where, I mean, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, like even though they average out at 60% volumetric losses, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that some of them vary from like 30 to 80%. And so yeah. you, what the, what's causing that variation? Um, yeah, we just don't know. Yeah. Because it's the same ground that you that you use. I mean, the, the constructors uh, there will not be a lot of difference. And I think it's 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 probably to do with uh, the uh, bio life, or you know, the the maybe the worms and the secondary um, infiltration rate that you could find with, with large pores, or uh, or the vegetation that that has a lot of roots. Or uh, but then again, the vegetation is more or less the same. But uh, it's quite in interesting to to look at it because I've. I would expect doing the research with permal pavement, permal pavement can show a lot of variation. Right. And that's because of the use is uh, different and uh, you know, the grid between the stones or the, the gaps, there's so many variations 
But if you have a, a low uh, grassy field, which basically is a, is a, a swale, and you have uh, three of them in the same district, I would find, I, I would expect to have a more uh, stable uh, infiltration rate. Yeah. But uh, but still, it's it, it's quite variable. Hmm. Yeah. It um. So, so, so two things bring up. One, another potential, just kind of throwing out ideas. Another potential source of variation I can see is there's a very common, uh, what's the word I want, like kind of scenario, I guess, that plays out in Australia where when you get a rain garden that's you know been established, got all these lovely native plants in it, and then obviously we have lots of issues with you know invasive weeds getting into systems and so people end up doing weed control in them where people go and accidentally use too much herbicide and end up over spraying and killing off some of the more sensitive species you see a very common kind of typology where you get this you get the occasional really resistant plant it's a lamandra for any australian australian viewers um you get the occasional lamandra and then spare ground around it. And that spare ground where it's been sprayed with herbicide get, like bakes on really, really hard, even though it's like it's quite a sandy soil, so it should be quite soft to the touch. It yeah. goes baked hard. It's really hard to kick your feet into it. But then if you go to a similar system with a really similar soil that's still got much more of its vegetation or which has some trees dropping leaf litter into it, you go and kick, yeah. you, you know, you scrape back the leaf litter, you kick the same soil and it's soft and fluffy and light and hasn't baked on hard. Yeah. So there's there's elements of that at play that tie into the vegetation as well, I would suspect. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you come across the... So thinking of, again, the where the water's going in variation, have you come across the research from... Uh, it's from Villanova Uni. I don't... Bridget... Uh, and her last name starts with W. Anyway, some researchers out of Villanova Uni who've installed a, what's the word I want? Um, a lysimeter, a weighing lysimeter in a bioretention system to, mo to yeah. essentially monitor um, water content changes within the soil over time. Because that's quite interesting because they've got some data on evapotranspiration losses out of rain gardens out of that, which might, mm, might be, yeah, might be of interest yeah. as well. Yeah, no, I don't know the research, but that, that maybe we should do more on uh, on the if you, if you transpiration. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, and they've um, I'm pretty certain they did some swale. I think they've got some data for swales as well. So I'll flick that to you offline. Yeah. So um, okay, so where do you see like where do you want to take this research next before we wrap this up and come to a conclusion? Like, what's your where are you yeah. where are you looking at taking this? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy with the research uh, results <laughs> the, yeah. to start. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to show municipalities and water authorities that you actually can infiltrate in a worst case scenario uh, in the Netherlands. That, that's that's uh, that's great. Uh, I proved that it is within the, gui the guideline of uh, infiltrating within two days, which is uh, which is fantastic. But it, it leaves me still with a puzzle that I cannot rhyme some of the locations having a lower permeability than others. Yeah. So uh, as we discussed, I think there's still research to be done. Uh, maybe you should uh, more look at other factors like evotranspiration or maybe uh, the bio life or the vegetation or mm. there's so much difference that uh, could uh, uh, yeah, cause these uh, differences. So um, I think that that's probably what, what's going on next. I'm going to do more uh, research on uh, optimizing uh, uh, swales that you know were close to two days. How can you, with uh, little uh, measures, uh, to upgrade the infiltration capacity, for example? That that will be uh, quite interesting, and uh, maybe compare it more uh, to international uh, uh, yeah, guidelines, but also research results, like I'm doing now with the rainwater gardens in Norway. Uh, you know what, what are the factors there? Maybe we can learn from that. And maybe some of the research that you have been uh, telling. I mean that that will be, yeah, getting the yeah the, all the the information across and maybe find out more on the details of uh, of the infiltrating and the re, uh, the repeating 
uh, of the filling of the swales. That's something I want to do as well. So why? Uh, what are the factors? If you if you flood it again, uh, uh, how much will the infiltration capacity? How does it vary in time? For yes. example, I think that's very important. Uh, uh, yeah, variation for for modelers that now uh, just say the permeability is just one value. But probably are not aware. Well, the models are not aware uh, of the uh, of the the, the, the yeah, spatial uh, variation of that. So I think that that's quite important for the research that I want to focus on. Yeah, cool. I like it. There's plenty of ideas. I'm I would love to see similar research happening on our on our rain gardens in in Australia. So I like it. There's some ideas that we can take from that and hopefully put into practice. Well, yeah, yeah. I am uh, planning maybe a trip uh, in July. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> By the way, to Australia. It's still uh, not confirmed, but uh, maybe we can do some floodings up there. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, let me know if you're coming. I'm happy to show you around. And um, yeah, if there's an opportunity to flood some rain gardens, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, look, thank you for taking the time to have a chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, if anyone wants to know either more about this research or for some reason contact you like where should where should people go to find out about either this or you what's what's the best options yeah the, the best option probably all my research i put on an open source uh, web-based uh, uh, international knowledge exchange forum which is uh, www.climatescan.nl uh, that's where uh, there's a agenda with the permal pavement and swales if you push that and you go to the netherlands you will see uh, most of the research that i've been doing uh, including some uh, time lapse, so you can see how the water will infiltrate. Uh, I can send you uh, some uh, jack as well. Maybe you can mix it in, or uh, uh, or maybe make some links to it. Yep. So uh, uh, and of course I'm on ResearchGate and LinkedIn, where I publish most of my uh, my uh, new research. Okay, wonderful. That's great. Look, thank you for time. Thank you for taking the time to have a chat. I appreciate it. Thank you as always, everyone, for listening in, and we will catch you next time. Okay. Thanks, there. Cool. See you later. Before you go, our best episodes come from your questions. This knowledge base, these discussions that our ID intro improve with your contribution. So if there's a topic, an idea, a concept that you would like us to explore, come and ask us. You know where to find us. www.idantro.com slash contact. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and that place you get your good podcasts from. You know where to find us. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll see you soon.